Uh, we'll start with a few housekeeping things this afternoon. Uh, as you know, those that have been here before, we have trash cans throughout. Um, we have those in the back over here. So, uh, and then if you need the restroom, it's back upstairs on the main level, right across from the gift shop. Okay, so those are a few of my housekeeping things. Now, welcome everyone to what is our very final lunch and learn here in this museum at the Polk Center. So you all are here on a very um, historic day for us as we close out our final programming, uh, at least adult programming here at the museum. We thank you all for joining us today. Got a great lunch and learn, very appropriate for the occasion. A few dates I would like for you to be aware of and take note of that are coming up is May 2nd. May 2nd is the big payback in Nashville, greater Nashville community. And as you are thinking about the places where you hold dear and would like to um, give back to, we encourage you to think about the Tennessee State Museum and the foundation uh, and the educational programming that, that, will go, that will go to support. And we hope that you would support us on May 2nd with the big payback, May 3rd. Although we are finishing programming uh, here in this space, we are not finishing programming. We will close, but we will still be doing lots of programming starting with May 3rd. Our curator, uh, Graham Perry, will be speaking at the Cumberland River Compact at the Bridge Building. So just go on down there for another great lunch and learn on the history of the Cumberland. You uh, can go to register for that at cumberlandrivercompact.org, okay? Uh, and then May 5th is our Pack the Wagon Party. This will be our final program. Please come back and help us celebrate this wonderful building that we've been in and these great exhibits that we've enjoyed all these years. And we hope that you'll come, bring your families, bring your friends, crafts, games, giveaways, and living history all throughout. So we're gonna have a fun time on Saturday, May 5th, uh, before we close the, this museum on May 6th, okay? So those are a few of my um, uh, dates to, to remember and to mark down on your calendar. Um, audience questions. After immediately following our Lunch and Learn today, we will have um, questions from the audience. Please uh, raise your hand and one of us will get around to you with a microphone. For those online, I know we have an online audience, uh, and uh, for those online, please type in your questions and we will also get to those as well. So uh, if you have a question for any of our on online audience, please uh, feel free to ask. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for today. Uh, if you know anything about the Tennessee State Museum, you know that this person is almost synonymous with the Tennessee State Museum. He is our chief curator and director of collections. Uh, he is responsible for the collections management and curatorial, curatorial work, which includes the statewide traveling exhibition program, as well as field service work throughout the state and uh, museum community. He has served as the president of the Tennessee Historical Society, the Tennessee Association of Museums, and the Intermuseum Council of Nashville. He holds graduate degrees in American history from UT Knoxville, and there is no better person to deliver our talk on the history of this fine institution, the Tennessee State Museum. Please help us welcome Mr. Dan Pomeroy to the And today is his birthday. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think what Jeff just told you is that I'm old. And as my friend Jack May uh, has commented, at my age I'm not responsible for anything that I say, so I have no fear uh, today. Um, appreciate you being here. This is an auspicious occasion. Uh, to paraphrase William Faulkner, the past is never past, and uh, that's certainly true with this institution. We are all part of the past, and uh, we are part of the past even as we look to the future and build for the future. The State Museum is about to open a spectacular new building and has an exciting path ahead of it. So it's helpful for all of us to pause at this time and remember those who came before us uh, to make this institution what it is. And uh, 
I'm going to start with Charles Wilson Peale in Philadelphia. Why, you ask, would I start with Charles Wilson Peale? Because in 1784, he opened a museum there of uh, collectibles uh, to, quote, instruct the mind and sow the seeds of virtue. Well, we here have a connection to Charles Wilson Peale and that uh, august founding. We have a portrait of our first governor, uh, John Sevier, which may be by Charles Wilson Peale, may be by his son, Rembrandt Peale, who was his partner in his museum endeavor. And this is one of our proudest artifacts. Uh, connected to the Tennessee Historical Society, which you're going to hear a lot about. Um, well, very much like Charles Wilson Peale, who, of course, uh, the museum, he, he benefited from that by showing off his artwork. Uh, we had a, a New Englander, Ralph E. W. Earle, who came to Nashville in 1817 to paint a portrait of Andrew Jackson. This portrait of Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans was painted by Earl in 1818, and it is part of the collection here. So we trace uh, through the Historical Society our history through the collection back to Ralph E. W. Earl, who founded a museum here in 1818, and it was in Nashville from 1818 to 1827, uh, a museum of, quote, natural, and uh, artificial uh, curiosities. Uh, there are those who think we still have a lot of curiosities around here, and some of us old staff members may be among that group. Uh, well, the uh, Ralph E. W. Earl was part of a group that founded the Tennessee Antiquarian Society in 1820. Uh, they were also on a, on a subsequent organization the Tennessee Society for the Diffusion of Knowledge in 1835. Now, we just don't use magical words like that anymore. Society for the Diffusion of Knowledge. I mean, it just doesn't get much better than that. Uh, well, uh, those two organizations effectively became the Tennessee Historical Society in 1849, and we owe a great debt to that organization. Uh, this is a painting that we recently acquired, like so much here, thanks to my colleague, Jim Hubler. Uh, it is a, uh, a painting by John Wagner of Nashville in 1859. You can see what Nashville looked like in 1859. You can only imagine what it looked like in 1818, uh, 1820, 1835. Uh, so there was a, gr but there was a great interest in collecting uh, artifacts of Tennessee history. And you can see in this painting off to the right, uh, the new Tennessee State Capitol, which was first occupied by the legislature and the governor in 1853. Um, the Tennessee Historical Society uh, moved its collection into the state capitol uh, beginning in, uh, in the 1850s. Well, the uh, uh, other things were afoot. The State Library was founded in 1854, uh, and so there were great movements afoot in this spectacular building, made quite a statement for Tennessee. Well, all of this was disrupted by the Civil War, secession in the Civil War in 1861, which literally tore the state apart. Uh, the collections of the Historic Society were either lost during the war, there was an effort to move them out before Tennessee was occupied by Union troops in 1862, to Polk Place, where Sarah Polk, the widow of James K. Polk, lived, and she protected those collections during the war. This is a wonderful photograph of the Capitol taken in 1864 by George Barnard, and uh, it was then known as Fort Johnson. The, the, uh, the grounds were fortified. Those are Union tents there. And uh, so this time of disruption took uh, a good deal of time to heal and uh, pull the state back together. The Tennessee Historical Society uh, more or less ceased operations 
until about 1874. Uh, the society then became re-engaged in collecting and preserving Tennessee history. I love this photograph. The society uh, commissioned Clark Mills to create an equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson, which still stands on the east side of the Capitol. And this is the unveiling in 1880, uh, another benefit from the Historical Society. And I, I'm just uh, uh, glad that I wasn't up on the roof there to see that unveiling. Um, a distinguished gentleman just walked in here and then I realized, oh, this is my son, Robert, who's in the audience. He and Jim Hubler ended up on the roof of the Capitol one time, but that's a story that will have to, you'll have to ask me about later. <laughs> well, the collection of the Stork Society moved around to various places. In 1886, it moved to Watkins Institute, which was on Church Street. <laughs> it was in the library up in the state capitol, <coughs> along with the library of the state, I wasn't able to find one of the beautiful photographs here where there are flags and all sorts of collections. Those portraits were uh, part of the Historic Society collection. Well, things began to change dramatically uh, with World War I and the end of World War I. These are soldiers, of course, uh, marching in downtown Nashville at the conclusion of the war. The, uh, veterans of the war were interested in creating a museum to commemorate their service. In 1921, a state historical museum was authorized by the General Assembly, and a veteran named George Beerworth uh, was instrumental and was named as curator. It was really the intention was to, to be a World War I museum or Great War Museum. And George Beerworth was one of those people were building our future on his shoulders. He remained active in the museum uh, through all of its uh, uh, labyrinths, uh, uh, routes, until uh, his death uh, in 1941, as I recall. Things began to change dramatically when the legislature built the War Memorial Building. Why is it called that? It is a memorial to the Great War. It was constructed largely through public subscription and was uh, opened and completed in 1925. Uh, not coincidentally, the collection of the uh, veterans of the Great War were then moved to the War Memorial Building. The collection of the Tennessee Historical Society were moved to the War Memorial Building, and the director of the society effectively became the curator of, uh, of these various collections. Ultimately, you had collections from the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Game and Fish Commission, it goes on and on and on. So you had all these desperate, disparate types of collections there with no real unifying element. Uh, in 1927, uh, just after this uh, opening, the Commissioner of Education uh, and the Commissioner of Agriculture and uh, uh, Commissioner of Agriculture created by uh, decree a state museum under the uh, library uh, to collate, preserve, and exhibit all objects relating to the history and culture of Tennessee and such objects as have economic and educational value by and with the approval of the governor of Tennessee. We hereby create a state museum to be located in the Memorial Building in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, a position of, uh, of uh, curator, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, director of the uh, state museum was created under the Commissioner of Education. Uh, actually was known as Keeper of Archives and the Museum. I recently, we recently received a, a lot of uh, documents and material from our friends at the State Library and Archives and I was particularly struck by a 1929 letter 
where the keeper of the archives and museum is asking for permission to put locks on display cases because people are stealing artifacts from the museum. And he has to get permission from the commissioner of education, so it goes out on bids, and I think the low bid was $56 in 1929, and he finally gets permission to put locks on the cases. So we've come a long way. Um, I love this photograph, which Jeff's, uh, Jeff found and uh, provided to me yesterday. I have no idea where this is. But of course, the museum was located in the basement of the War Memorial Building, as we are in the basement of this building. Uh, <clears throat> I wish I knew where that sign is. I'd love to have that in the collection. <coughs> well, in 1937, the legislature determined to create a Tennessee State Museum for the purpose of bringing together the various collections owned by or managed by the state of Tennessee. So the Game Fish Commission, the Veterans of World, World of the Great War, the Veterans of the Spanish-American War, the United Dollars, the Confederacy, all this is now to be managed by this new entity, the Tennessee State Museum, under the Department of Education. Uh, another great advancement was after World War II, uh, the legislature uh, made the decision to build a new state library, State Library and Archives, which was completed in 1953. And as you know, the, as concurrent with the change of the State Museum here, there's, there's a new Library and Archives building currently under construction on the Bicentennial Mall. And this is going to be a great great future for the people of Tennessee to have a new state museum and a new library and archives, sister organizations down there together. But this was a great uh, step forward, 1953. It was built as a memorial to the veterans of World War II. I think it's interesting to look back at some of the artifacts and the collections from this museum in the War Memorial Building. I admire so much uh, the staff and the work they did in this museum uh, with very little pay and very little support to try to save and preserve and exhibit and interpret these collections uh, of Tennessee from these very sources. This is known as the Snake Exhibit. Uh, natural history was very important, and you'll also notice photographs up there from the Great War, so you can learn about snakes and the Great War. <laughs> and there may be some connection, actually. Uh, I love this, uh, aquatic waterways of Tennessee and aquatic features and fish, and I'm particularly struck by the swordfish. Uh, I think that was in Lake Watauga up in East Tennessee somewhere, I think. It must have been. <laughs> And the polar bear. Someone asked me just before this, uh, where's the polar bear? Well, we still have the polar bear in our collection. I think that was in the Smoky Mountains. This one came out of the Smoky Mountains somewhere. I'm really not sure. Uh, <clears throat> it is now on loan to the Children's Museum in Oak Ridge. And yes, it is still in our collection. I believe that's Colonel Daniel there. Uh, who killed this polar bear and then donated it to the State Museum, showing it to a young lady probably about 1955. And, of course, no one can speak of the museum without mentioning the mummy. This would be the display about 1955. And, of course, this is also from the collection of the Tennessee Historical Society, brought here to Tennessee about 1860 by Jeremiah George Harris, and given to the society for the edification of the people of Tennessee. That's what people did in the 19th century. That's how they extended learning and the opportunities for learning. And it was first exhibited, as I'm sure everyone knows here, in the state capitol, along with the Historical Society collection. Uh, I love this. Cases all for Native American artifacts, along with uh, statesmen from the Tennessee. This was. This was uh, open storage before it became fashionable to have open storage. <laughs> I had to show this. Uh, one of my favorite uh, people in the history of the state of Tennessee 
and the Tennessee State Museum. This is Fred Estes on the left. He was director of the State Museum from 1953 until his death in 1969, and this man did so much to preserve the collection here and further the history of this institution. Enough can't be said about him. He was a World War I veteran and uh, 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 was in the 114th Field Artillery, and he is here with two of his fellow veterans also in the artillery, and they're looking at this German mortar, Minenwerfer, which we still have in the collection. It's over in the War Memorial Building, and if you haven't visited the Military Museum in the War Memorial Building, which is in the original uh, confines of the State Museum, please take a trip over there. We're very proud of it. Uh, there, are quite, there are a number of artifacts that have been taken out because we're going to have them in the new museum, but we're attending to that. It's still well worth a visit. This is the entrance to the uh, military museum. It is on the south side of the War Memorial Building. This was the entrance to the State Museum. This is where everything was housed. Please take a trip over there. Well, just so you can see that we were not alone, this is the North Carolina History Museum about 1940. So Fred Estes and his colleagues and the work they did was very similar to what was going on all around the country. There were a lot of people doing good work uh, because they were committed to it. Uh, this is the uh, Hall of Governors and those of who are familiar with the collection, you recognize these ladies here worked with Fred Estes and they're, they've got uh, David Crockett's powder horn. I believe that's Andrew Jackson's uh, presentation sword there. There's the bench made by David Crockett for Lawrence County. All of that's still in the collection. So we today are a legacy of the work these folks did. Well, there were members of the, uh, of, in government, particularly legislative leaders, who thought it was time to try to move this museum forward in a more professional direction. And I particularly would mention John Bragg of Murfreesboro, who was chairman of the House Finance Committee, and Senator Douglas Henry, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, I'm also going to mention, uh, uh, since I'm originally from Kingsport, I'm obliged to do this, Bruce Shine, a lawyer out of Kingsport, who was uh, a member of the Tennessee Arts Commission. And Bruce was instrumental in moving the uh, management of the museum from the Department of Education to the new Tennessee Arts Commission, which was created as part of the National Endowment for the Arts. And so this created uh, new opportunities for the State Museum. And uh, John Bragg and Senator Henry uh, uh, moved forward to try to find a new and better uh, facility for the museum. There are various sites who were in, that were investigated uh, professionally trained staff began, began to come on. I was struck by the fact that in a report from the director in 1972 said there were six staff members here and they didn't have a guard. They only had a guard available when the legislature wasn't meeting and there was an extra guard available to come to the State Museum. So we can all be uh, uh, glad that they did put those locks on those cases. Uh, well, all of this then began to coincide with an effort to create the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. And so it was determined that the State Museum would be part of this effort to build Tennessee Performing Arts Center, Tennessee State Museum, and then the State Office Building uh, on top. And this was approved by the Building Commission in 1972. Uh, everything I hesitate, uh, I'm admitting my age here. I was part of that effort. I will have to tell you that the collection here was so small and so weak that capital funds were provided to us to buy artifacts. We literally didn't have a strong enough collection to uh, populate this museum and tell the story of Tennessee history. We've made such great strides in building up the collection here and there are so many people here 
who should be thanked and so many uh, people who are not here, like my colleague Jim Kelly, who have done so much to build up the collection of this museum. Uh, this is the Fifth Avenue entrance to the museum. There was no entrance, street level entrance to the museum when we moved into this space. But the fact is, we're still in the basement, aren't we? Yeah, hard to find, hard to get to. Um, we just learned this morning, uh, Joe just sh shared with us, uh, that we've been selected as the top museum in Tennessee by USA Today. So I think that says something for all the people and all the hard work that's gone on here by so many over the decades. Uh, the exhibits here, I think, uh, did a wonderful job of telling the story of Tennessee, and uh, I, for one, am going to miss them as we look to the future. Uh, now, part of that future is that uh, the legislature determined in 2009 to take the State Museum out from the Arts Commission, and they created a museum commission, aptly named the Douglas Henry a State Museum Commission. Senator Henry was always a guiding light to this institution and frankly will always be so much a part of our history and our future. And that, that opened all sorts of new opportunities for the future of this institution. Um, the Frontier exhibits the Conestoga Wagon. I see my friend Ron Westfall here who did so much to uh, restore this wagon. Uh, there are just so many people who should be thanked for what's going on here. And I had to take a picture of collection storage. Being an artifact kind of guy, being a collections nerd, I have to say, uh, as you go through this whole museum, about uh, 50,000 square feet, I'm sorry, Barry, I said I wouldn't mention square feet, a lot of space, and a lot of exhibits, that's about two and a half percent of the artifacts in the collection. That is something we can all be proud of because this collection offers so many opportunities to show wonderful things in the future. We now have, I think, clearly the finest Civil War collection, Civil War reconstruction. Uh, we have over 60 original Civil War, Tennessee Civil War flags, unsurpassed. We have uh, a, a spectacular collection from significant personalities like Houston, David Crockett, Andrew Jackson, James K. Polk, and the list goes on and on and on. We have a spectacular collection of maps, Tennessee imprints. We have the finest collection, Tennessee quilts and coverlets, samplers. We have the finest collection of Tennessee firearms, uh, paintings, crafts, sculpture. It's just an unsurpassed collection of artifacts. And the staff that works here and the staff that has put this together and maintains this collection, I can't say enough good things about them. And we're now looking to move another step forward and have the opportunity to share more of this collection with the people of Tennessee. And I, I, I should mention, I don't want to throw out statistics here. How did this collection grow? In 1975, there were about 7,500 artifacts in the collection. In 2014, there were about 150,000 artifacts in the collection. And it's projected by one of the consultants working with us, by 2033, we're going to have about 250,000 artifacts in the collection. And is anybody on the registration registration staff can tell you it is growing leaps and bounds, both in quality and in numbers. So we're about to open in the fall of this year a new building. It's a building. This is a building. The Tennessee State Museum is like a church and a congregation. It's a building. The congregation is what makes the church. The collection and the staff and the and the history and the legacy of the staff is what makes the Tennessee State Museum. This new building's gonna be wonderful. And one of the wonderful things about it, it's gonna have four rotating galleries where we can put new artifacts out, constantly change them, so the people will be able to see 
more than they have ever been able to see before. We have two large <clears throat> changing galleries totaling, uh, sorry Barry, 8,000 square feet where we can bring in major shows and we can put on our own major shows and show people wonderful things, wonderful things. You don't realize that behind this wall right here is a 1917 fire engine from Memphis. We've never been able to show it to the public. Maybe we can do that in the future. We hope that we can. So I'm glad, thank you for being here and thank you for being part of this wonderful commemor commemorative moment, remembering the State Museum and the people who came before us and taking a look at our bright new future. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, make them easy. I'm sorry. Is the parking going to be better? There will at be the parking. <laughs> yes, you will not only see the museum, know how to get to it, you will be able to park. Yes. Uh, no, it's all above ground. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Pomeroy. In addition to the rotating galleries, uh, will. Uh, digital uh, technology be available to make uh, uh, qua high quality uh, photographs and images of uh, items from the collection also available for the public to see? Thank you very much for that, uh, Bob Buchanan, who's president of the Tennessee Historical Society and also on the museum's governing commission. Yes, that's also a very important aspect of the new museum. Uh, we're, for the first time, going to be having artifacts online so you can, uh, from your home, you can come in and learn something about the collection. And at the museum, there's great depth of information for interactives and, and, and digital learning. There's a whole children's section, children's gallery. We've never had that capability before. Jeff could tell you about that. But uh, yeah, they're gonna be, there's such depth of information in this new museum. We've never had that ability before. What will happen to this current space? To the, oh, this building? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. You'd have to ask that question of people further upstream than I am. I'm pretty well focused on the collection and what we're trying to do here right now. Do you know if there'll be a charge no, no, it's no, this will be, be free. free. Oh, wow. awesome. Yes, if you get the opportunity, give Governor Haslam a pat on the back and any member of the General Assembly. Thanks. I was going to ask about what's going to happen to this area because of the Red Grooms painting on the wall here. Is it potentially going to be preserved somehow or is that up in the air still? Thank you. I'm not aware of any way that this mural could be preserved. Uh, we are uh, looking at collection storage, and I gave you some idea of the growth of the collection. We've got 28,000 square feet of collection storage space here. We got things stacked on top. And once this museum closes, after May the 5th, we're going to be utilizing all of this display area for more collection storage. but we need a collection storage facility, custom design for that purpose. And that is the long range goal. And so uh, if that's accomplished, this will be used for other purposes by the state. I, I could tell you that we have something in the neighborhood of three, 350 red grooms objects, Red Groom's art in the collection. So he will not be forgotten, I can assure you of that. <laughs> and, and we're opening a Red Groom's gallery in the new museum. Speaking of Red Groom's, is there any news about the carousel, if it's gonna go on display? The carousel is in the collection and there are uh, uh, efforts made to see how it can be put up and used by the public. At the last museum commission meeting, 
a subcommittee is going to be appointed a governing commission so that they can assess all the possibilities and hopefully find a pathway to accomplish that.